This episode is dedicated to the, the memory of the late Shinzo Abe, Premier of Japan, a true friend of liberty in Asia and around the world. On my heart of tempered steel, and leave your girls and farms, your sports and plays and holidays, and hark away to arms, and fare thee well, your sweetheart. Your smiling girls are due And when the war is over We'll kiss it out with you Hi, this is Joseph. I'm here with Isaac. Hi, Joseph. Hi. So, we are going to foray into the dark world of politics, into that particular quagmire, as we discussed in our most recent episode, episode 10 which capped off that particular season. And in the interest of making a Chinese wall, these days in finance it's called a firewall, but before the PC police came around it was called the Chinese wall, we're going to keep our episodes that are strictly historical separate from our strictly political ones in order to keep the political ones in the political episodes and try to keep our academic ones somewhat uh, neutral in, in the political tone, even though that is difficult and increasingly difficult in our hyper-polarized charged world. In which uh, making any sort of opinion, expressing any sort of opinion about any current event or topic is plain Russian roulette. Or as the Russians call it, American roulette. So first a procedural note, in this our first political episode I would like you to reintroduce you to our wonderful podcast. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll be discussing a bit of politics. Our current experiment is that we'll be speaking about several subjects during each episode. You'll do a bit of a scattershot. In this particular episode, Isaac will mention a couple of subjects, including uh, some of the systems of democracy and how they are fearing in today's world, and the creation of a cult of personality and how it fears. And I will be speaking about a couple of issues one of them being the Russian invasion of Ukraine. But before that, I'll be speaking about abortion. And each of us will speak at some length on the subject, and then we will have a bit of a conversation on, the, on that particular matter, and then we'll move on to the next, next segment, and thus we will try to neatly divide into four segments. That is our current plan of operation. Let me start with the abortion. So, why are we anti-abortion? This subject is very much in the news because Roe v. Wade, as our American audience would certainly know, and much of the Western audience, Roe v. Wade, the seminal court case, and maybe one of the most or the most famous court cases of all time in the United States, having to do with abortion, that is going on a half a century years old, was overturned by the Supreme Court of the United States in a very narrow decision, in a 5-4 decision. Three of those five justices, I might add, appointed by the most recent president. So, very jarring moment in political life. I wish not to speak about the actual case and the actual laws and deciding the constitutionality of whether murder is in the Constitution, whether depriving someone of their liberties is in the Constitution, whether the word privacy, which is not, does not exist in the 4,000 word document of the Constitution, is a real right, as it was I believe mistakenly accorded in the 1970s, and whether or not abortion should be left to the states or not. Oftentimes, especially conservatives, when they're tasked with speaking about abortion, either they're worried or concerned about speaking about the moral issue or they try to deflect away from that, they will firstly try to say, well, this decision only brings it back to the states and so on, and they kind of somewhat wisely skirt the issue. But in this show, we will not try to skirt most issues. So let us address the case head on for a few minutes. I would start by saying that the following I took from a lecture by one Catholic theologian, Dr. Peter Craves. Perhaps Isaac, in our back and forth part of the conversation, will tell me if he's ever heard of this guy before. But Dr. Peter Craves, Catholic theologian, still alive, approaching a 90, God protect him has an hour-long episode on this subject on, you can go on YouTube, Dr. Peter 
Kreeft. It's spelled with K R E E F T. And look in Logical Life in YouTube, and you'll see. As I will try to distill it in a few minutes. He's very much an Aquinas scholar. He's very logical. I will not do justice to the force of his arguments. But just to summarize, and why we are against abortion, and why we think the law in the country or in the state or in any lawful or reasonably uh, lawful state in, in the world should be against a mother or the mother with the help of a doctor killing the child yet unborn in the womb is a very logical argument in his view and it rests on three premises that I will only focus on one of which um, premise number one all humans are human life begins at conception I'll be focusing on this one the second premise is that once you have a human, the human has a right to life or you have an obligation not to kill him. I'm going to skip over this and take it as a given that once we acknowledge that there is a human person here, we should not kill the person and avoid the thorny questions of self-defense and so on. A person should not kill another person in cold blood, then it is murder. And if this person is a human living person alive and so on, you should not kill him. End the story. The th third of his premises, which are also skip over for now is that once we established a the scientific and, and moralistic case that humans are human and b the jurisprudential and moral case that it's forbidden to kill a person or that a person has a right to life the third premise is that once we have those things in mind we should advocate or we should be in favor or we should insist on having a legal system that prevents people from violating the life force of the other person by ending it and killing it. So I'm going to skip that third premise, which is a given for much of uh, our society in America and indeed for much longer. I'll skip the second one, that once you have a human being, he has the right to life, it's forbidden, forbidden to kill him in cold blood. Let us focus on the, third, on the first one, and this in fact is usually the hot button issue. All humans are human, with life begins at conception, because if indeed there's nothing but some extraneous cells. It's like taking out your appendix or even just cutting off your fingernails. Why would it be wrong to kill a human? Except for perhaps you're saying that, well, this is a potential human and you're preventing a human from being born in the world or whatever. But if it in fact is not a human, if it's not, if there is no person there, then I would put to you, abortionists and anti-abortionists alike, then there shouldn't be anything so egregiously wrong as to equate with murder. But let me ask our abortionist friends to just Consider for a slight moment, put away all your prior notions and think perhaps this person, this entity that's growing inside the person with gradual and then rapid development, developing a heartbeat. Over. If this entity, this person, this human being is in fact a living, breathing, a living person deserving of those rights, then you would of course be in favor of not killing the person. Even if you say the lady has a right to privacy and be in charge of her own body and to make her own decisions, and even if this is some terrible situation where she wasn't expecting this, or God forbid she was forced into this by a really bad relationship, because any sort of argument of utility, which means to say, oh, it would be the most wonderful thing in the world to kill this person, or it would be so beneficial to society, or if we don't kill all these unborn children, it would be so much uh, pernicious for society, you will cost welfare dollars. All those arguments... They'll grow up to be my favorite. Ever since, uh, ever since Roe versus Wade, we have less criminals because all those unwanted babies were, were simply not born, and therefore... Instead yes, of being born and would, being would, neglected. I would kindly ask you because I don't want to lose my train of thought. If, if, if indeed that is the case, that there is a tremendous utilitarian argument in killing this child, any sort of argument like that could be said about murdering a full-grown human. If there is in fact a utilitarian view in the world, irrespective of whether or not this entity in the womb is in fact a person deserving of life or deserving not to be killed, then a child at one minute old, at one day old, a week, one week old, a year old, or 20 years old would be able to be killed by the same utilitarian argument. And if it could be determined by scientific study that if we were to countenance and sanction assassination on the high roads, as, as opposed to sanction, having assassinations with a bomb, like they took out Dugan's daughter recently and so on, which is a whole messy business. If you were to say, let's have legal assassinations and this would be better for society, I don't think anybody would say, let us have it. Let's, if you would say sanctioning, you know, 
five day old or five minute old babies would be good for society. Most of us, except, except for perhaps the late governor of uh, Virginia, Northam, most of us would be against, even our staunch abortionists, the ones the child is alive not to do this. So therefore we have to specifically focus on this, on this question whether or not there is a person with life. Let's, and let us say, you say there is not a person with life. You have to acknowledge that for hundreds and thousands of years since the Roman world, since, since the uh, first century AD when Augustus started making a big deal about abortions and so on, abortions have been viewed with tremendous uh, moral aporium and in fact perhaps be considered murdered uh, by a vast swaths of society. Even today, half of society considers a murder. At least half of the rabbis, the theologians, the priests, the thinking people, or at least a significant amount consider a murder. Now, so if you aren't sure whether or not this is a person or it's not a person, then how could you go and kill it on the premise that it would be good or it's legal or it helps the person's privacy? Um, if it, in fact, you have a possibility of doubt. But you must have a possibility of doubt. How could you be certain that this thing inside the mother's womb this for so long was considered to be a person is not in fact a person and if you had a doubt in other cases would you kill that person if you went out hunting and you saw somebody in the woods would you say well maybe it's a person maybe it's a deer i'm going to take the shot well as dr peter craft's example and i saw this video a long time ago but i think this is one of the examples if you see a robot but you're not sure if it's a robot or a person dressed very well like a robot would you go and kill the person on the assumption that perhaps you're not killing a person you're just killing a robot no if you had a real doubt, and there must be a real doubt, if for so long and so many people and there's such strong convictions and there's so much science on the question of whether or not this person inside the womb is a fact a person, could you kill it? And the answer is, even if you think it's not a person, but if you have a doubt if it's a person or not, you may not murder someone if there's a doubt whether or not this person is being murdered. And this is Dr. Peter Kreft's main argument, which I've tried to give some justice in a nutshell. The three premises, it goes down to this one premise that the human is a human, and it begins at conception, and that even if you are in favor of abortion, you must have a doubt about it, and therefore you cannot pull the trigger, you cannot, in this case, use the, you know, hand coat wire or more professional sterilization methods that the doctors use to kill the baby, and end of rant. That is the abortion argument. Well, um, allow me to say, so to, to say something. Uh, on a matter of abortion, you mentioned the, the argument all humans are human. That's a very co cogent argument because human beings, because this argument of abortion, and like many other great moral arguments we have over the centuries, is what makes a human? What, what makes human beings human beings? So, for example, um, I hate to bring it back to slavery, but uh, slave owners, you would say, ah, there's those uh, those Africans that I have on my plantation. You see, they are technically human in the sense they are coming from the Gens Humana, and they are technically Homo sapiens, but they are not fully human because they lack in they maybe not in because they lack in this maybe they lack in intelligence every. Uh, every basically every race in the South had, had a different reason why Africans are not are not fully human and therefore can be owned as chattel. Um, uh, Which is bizarrely even a sign of some advancement because for much of the history of the world, if you own the slave, you own the slave. You own the slave. You don't have to worry about you justifying. Didn't, you didn't that this own a, you, did, you didn't own a slave because he wasn't you. The Romans did not own slaves because the slaves were less than human. They owned the slaves because they bought because they bought them. They, or, they or pay good money or, for them. And pay good money for them. Or alternatively, uh, kidnapped, kidnapped or captured them fair and square um, in, in battle or in a, or in a slavery or, or what have you. It was a very particular phenomenon. And also, this is actually something interesting that you mentioned. Uh, so Republicans will often compare abortion to slavery. Have you, yes. have you seen that? Yes. Uh, it, it's in the sense, so there are two kinds of, of Republicans and in, anti-abortionists in, in, in general who compare uh, uh, abortion to slavery. One is making the argument that I am mentioning right now that, oh, you say that, uh, that a fetus is not human. Well, they used to say that Africans are not human and therefore uh, and, and therefore you can uh, treat, them, treat them horribly and with impunity. Um, uh, that's one argument. The other argument is 
um, that d is to emphasize the seriousness of the moral cause that we have. That you know we ha we used to have uh, that there is this thing that was this practice that half the country used to used to have, and now when and we had a very spirited political de very fiery political debate about it, and a hundred years later. In 150 years later, we don't even understand the position. How could any rational human being could even argue those uh, argue for this practice? So that's one thing. But I don't want to dwell on sla on slavery because slavery is just one of many cases. For example, um, there was a time in which people say that we should ster sterilize uh, people who are mentally challenged or suffer from mental illnesses. And the definition of mental illnesses was fairly broad. It it, it included, for example, homosexuality, and uh, the and the and the reasoning. I, I would say that the intellectual support for this eugenics that you speak of mm -hmm. was more widespread than the intellectual support mm -hmm. for slavery. Yeah, the absolutely. But the argument is essentially the same argument. A mental uh, that a mental Graham Bell. Yes, the, Woodrow Wilson. Yes, exactly. Uh, all these people supporting eugenics, yeah. what you're describing. Yeah, absolutely, because the, the, their argument was the, the thing that defines human beings as human beings is intelligence. If human beings are not intelligent, therefore they are not human beings. Uh, if we go to the Middle Ages, uh, theologians, uh, both Muslims and Christian theologians, argued that it's okay to kill infidels because uh, be, because what defines a human being as a, human, as a truly human being is his relationship with God. An infidel has no relationship with God. Um, I, of course, the, of course, not all theology uh, theologians at the time agreed with this statement. Therefore, it's okay to it's all right to kill infidels, especially as they withholding uh, the, the sacred sites for a particular religion. Um, uh, oh yeah, I, I know, I know. I, ju I just stepped on a, on a landmine. Uh, it's okay. I, it's okay. I can handle the hate. The hate. If they if there is hate mail, they can just send it. To me, I'll, I'll burn it. Pure box. Yes. So, any final thoughts on abortion before so, we go an, on to your? So, support? the thing is, we want to deal with this case with abortion. We, whenever we are asking these questions, we are asking a question like this: Are human beings human beings? Is at what? So, the real question we essentially needs to needs to decide and to declare that all questions that that no qualifications is needed. To declare a human being human. Uh, for example, if you have a human being, and he is and he is in existence, uh, then you cannot deny that because of his intelligence, his lack of uh, physical, um, his lack of, of, of physical develop development, or his uh, or his physical physiog physiognomy. His geographic location. Yes, there was an argument that his the theological connection to the God. Yes, his uh, his, his religion. His uh, that no matter how wretched in every respect he ha he is, and if he is, no matter his characteristics or qualifications or or, uh, or opinions or, or whatever else, he is human, and all human beings are brothers, and human be and brothers ought not kill each other without good reason. That's I know it's it's a bit of a low bar, but. Well, that is a good way to end this particular segment. But, Brothers but, 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 with, oh, but the word. real argument about abortion is not... Sh the only legitimate argument about abortion, actually the only two legitimate argument is, not is this thing a human being, but is this a thing a being? Is this... Did uh, the fetus already reach... At what point does a fetus reach the level in which we say this is a being, this is an entity with... Uh, with a separate existence from the uh, from the one from the entity that originated it, and that's a legitimate argument, and we can have this argument. I have my own opinions about it. Uh, other people have their, have their own, and and another thing, another argument is at what point does the uh, at what point do we say the existence of this entity? Overrides the, whatever damage may happen to the entity that originated it. So, in case of danger to the life of the mother, uh, we say you, most anti-abortionists say that um, most anti-abortionists say that we prioritize the mother. Why is that? Well, there are reasons. There, there are reasons for that, and 
and those reasons are, ver- are varied and we can discuss them but this is things that we ought to discuss on the merits and on the facts and I want to finish this segment with the quote by John Adams facts are stubborn things and whatever may be our wishes our inclinations or the dictates of our passion they cannot alter the state of fact and evidence well said no foreign slave shall give us laws no British tyrants reign this independence made us free and freedom will maintain and we're up to our next segment we've just finished abortion now Isaac to you what are we talking next well this time we'll talk about everybody's favorite favorite uh, uh, Winnie the Pooh impersonator Xi Jinping president of China Sec- G- general secretary of the Chinese Communist Party actually it goes general secretary of the secretariat of the Central Committee of the Chinese Communist Party <laughs> thank you and um, com- um, chairman of the military Chairman of the Central Military Commission and various other and various other uh, illustrious titles which means basically that he is the ruler of China um, so uh, how did it how does one become such a um, such an uh, elevated personage well I She exemplifies a trend that is very troubling all across the world in which um, um, collective action uh, collective political action and reasoning is giving way to cults of personality in which one person sees power he uh, he de- he starts as the first among equals in his circle then he slowly but surely um, purges a uh, snips snips and snaps away everybody else from this circle he elevates to the circle his favorites and the circle that used to be a circle of equals in which he was merely the first amongst uh, turns into a circle of underlings to which he is not mi- to, to which he is lo- lord and master and those underlings to maintain their positions and uh, have the to scrape down and bow before before he before the almighty uh, grand uh, pungent dumb of um, of Ruritania um, so how did, so Xi Jinping is a very interesting case because the rise of Xi Jinping was very very um, preventable uh, there was a, actually an article in foreign affairs that d- details how uh, the uh, the greatest uh, competitor to uh, Xi Jinping to be elevated to uh, to the presidency in 2012 instead of Xi Jinping uh, Bo Shilai uh, who was uh, just like Deng Xiaoping uh, was the mayor of Chongqing um, was essentially the victim of what we can call political assassination uh, his chief of police um, for some reason It was denied uh, some sort of a promotion he f- he went to uh, he he re- he defected to the British consulate which was very very surprised by by this turn of event because that not something that happens every day and they were not sure what to do with him and that led to a whole cascade of event which ended up with uh, with the purging of Bo Shilai and his entire political faction from the Communist Party uh, by what I understand most of them are still Are still in jail um, and that and Xi Jinping is a person who ought to know a thing or two about uh, the effects of pe- of cults of personality because his father was who was a high-ranking uh, communist officials and the official and the Mao uh, was actually purged during the Cultural Revolution he was he went to a uh, He went to uh, to a camp for a while and as a matter of fact the fa- 
as a matter of fact, the family was forced for a while to move into the countryside and, and young she had to attend university on a on what on uh, on a soldier uh, on a soldier peasant worker um, quota, which is basically the um, uh, basically the the way in which uh, which was supposed to guarantee that uh, that the, the Chinese intelligentsia would not become self perpetuating uh, class, but would be con- con- constantly infused with uh, with um, with uh, members from the people at la- at large but in effect is a device used by uh, used by communist party officials to put their um, to put the um, the the less than brilliant children into university or at least used to be until it was i believe it was abolished anyhow um, so this is how she came to power and the result of his uh, cult of personality can be seen nowadays because uh, currently we have people um, gen- we have people in hazmat suits disinfecting runways at airports with uh, with lime with quick lime because he decreed that we must de- defeat uh, the China must defeat COVID nineteen. Now, whatever would be the, your opinion about this particular malady and um, in the correct way to address it, I believe the, the I believe the argument exhausted itself. Uh, the, 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 in, to, in, to the, in 2021, everybody ran out of fresh arguments. But uh, um, uh, it's clear. I don't believe that anybody say, would think this is wise or, or, or advisable or or helpful in any way, shape, or form. Um, and this is because in cult of personality, first of all, uh, we mentioned facts before. Nobody listens to facts. Facts are important only when you are... Why? Because facts are important only in a debate. In a debate between equals to win the debate, which human beings like to really, really like to do, because if you win the debate first, it really strikes your ego very, very, in a very nice and pleasant manner. And second, it means that your ideas prevail and what you want is, get, is getting done, usually. So, uh, so facts are very useful for you in a debate between equals. But when you don't have a debate between equals, when the style of when leadership is a cult of personality, essentially that uh, whatever the leader, the dear leader wants, the dear leader gets, and so all the only debate between fact between equals it is about what dear leader wants. Then uh, facts co- are completely banished from the system. The only facts that matter are the quote unquote facts about the state of mind of the dear leader and those are no facts of all at all because nobody can know what in with within the mind of dear leader because dear leader is usually smart enough that's how it came to be dear leader to uh to to not disclose fully his opinions and and, and desires just in a, just express his wishes in a general way we ought uh, to aim towards mo- as she put it, uh, moderate prosperity. Now, that li- li- leaves a lot of leeway. And if something it turns up belly up, it's not the fault of the leader, is, is it? Or you misunderstood moderate. Or you misunderstood prosperity. Either way, you misunderstand me. You are at fault. You're probably a saboteur. How much do the American pay you? Anyhow, let's, uh, that's, my eight, that's my eight minutes. Dear leader, well, first I had to laugh when you were talking about the quick lime on the, on the runaways as to fight COVID. So that's uh, <laughs> we've seen a lot of hilarious stuff coming out coming out of the COVID era. People cleaning their mail, people uh, doing various types of things, driving with a mask inside the car by mm-hmm. themselves. But using the quick the quick lime on runaways, I would also mention that uh, quick lime was often used during, in in war. I think the British used it sometimes in the nineteenth century. You ever hear about this? No, they would kind of burn it, and it's almost kind of a, kind of a chemical weapon. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Uh, yeah, yeah. We'll have to get back to you on the British use of quick climb as a weapon. Hmm. Um, a long time ago, back when the British could defeat the Chinese quite easily, hmm. before the Chinese had their own supposedly stealth airplanes and aircraft carriers. It's very easy to. It's much more pleasant to fight someone who is stuck in the 17th century, and assuming that you are. 
an a uh, 19th century army who already invented some sort of machine guns. Well, I do in the future hopefully we want to discuss with you and get your thoughts on the current military uh, might of the Chinese and I know you and I have different opinion about um, how strong the uh, Chinese military is vis-a-vis um, ourselves and so on. So that might be a fruitful conversation. Another thing I was wondering, why hasn't Xi killed the rival faction which you say is in jail? Is it out of his tender mercies? Um, yes and no. The thing is, the Chinese Communist Party is a very, very convoluted system that nobody understood truly, especially not in the outside world, especially not as two schmucks who never came within a, within, in a sniffing distance of, uh, of, uh, of classified intelligence. To take the, bear this in mind. What we know is, because that she has, a lot, has quite a lot of power in the party, that officials are devising policy around what she would like, what would earn them the favor of she. But there's, but it's possible that there are, uh, and we pretty sure that there are factions inside the Communist Party uh, that are opposed to she or would like um, to, uh, or that she does not want to go into all-out conflict with. The thing is, she right now have complete stranglehold on Chinese government because he has comp- because he has a good stranglehold on the Chinese Communist Party. But it does not mean that every that there are not many people in Chinese Communist Party that are not at least partially um, not entirely on his side. Um, the thing is. As I said, she spent a lot of time purging people from the actually the actual part of the Chinese Communist Party that hold power, but it doesn't mean that he purged the entire Communist Party, and in by extension he can't do whatever he wants. And besides, what's the point of killing uh, Bo Xilai and his supporters and his old supporters? Even Mao did not bother to kill all the people that he imprisoned. She's father among them. Uh, because what's the point? They are completely discredited at this point and they can return to political power only through the favor of their leader. Um, and so they are in actually a, in useful. A way he has a hold over them. Exactly. In a way, it's actually use, it's a useful pool of talent that he can draw upon if he wants to. And if he doesn't want to, then he doesn't. Then they stay in jail, where they hold no danger to him. Yes, yes, fascinating stuff. I also want to mention that you said you used the term first among equal." I, I assume you had in mind, um, you know, this. I think uh, Augustus used that term first, and so on. Oh yeah. Uh, so this is a a, a uh, term laden with meaning. Mm-hmm. Um, Augustus, who. Um, for his very complicated and convoluted rise to power, kind of like to, from time to time, pretend as if the Republic was giving him back his power so he would be reinstated for five and ten year dictatorships mm-hmm. throughout his 35 year rule. Oh yeah. Is Xi doing something similar or is he now boss man number one so he's in forever? So essentially, right now, she is, uh, the Chinese Communist Party just had uh, one of its sessions, which is long, long and arduous process just to explain it, but uh, essentially the Chinese Communist Party of China uh, uh, assembled together and made some decisions for the next for a few years, um, and he agreed to step down from the role of general secretary and retain the presidency for for a third term, of for a third ten years term. And it's a long, long story, and he'll probably uh, stay president for life. That's probably his intention. Uh, so, and from time to time, um, the uh, the what they call in China the paramount leader would give up one of his titles and, t- and take another one. Mao did it a couple of times. Deng Xiaoping did it a few times until he fell from power in 1989 as, as a result of the Tiananmen massacre. Um, uh, and so forth, and, and so on and so forth. What's important in China is not are not the official titles. What's important in China is the 
unofficial position of paramount leader. Uh, as a, if you, we go to the Augustus uh, comparison, there were times during Augustus' long, long reign which he had no official position in the Roman government. It just so happened that everybody did whatever Augustus wanted. <laughs> nice work if you can get it. Uh, so let me uh, let me just get your uh, rapid fire question, get your initial thought. Mm -hmm. um, so it may be unlike in the Soviet system where they had two people after Stalin, mm -hmm. uh, and and power was diluted between the general secretary and, and the premier. Um, that may or may not be the case in China. But if he gave up his general secretaryship, I'm thinking there's two possibilities. Either he neutered the role to such an extent that it's no longer meaningful because he still retains the presidency, mm -hmm. or he put one of his um, acolytes there that he has full control over or power over or faith in. Do you think it's one of these two possibilities? I think it's I think it's the uh, I think it's somewhere in between because the, the the new general secretary is about to be Li Keqiang. Li Keqiang is is supposed to be the policy the economic policy wonk of the uh, and I hate those this word but uh, of the Chinese Communist Party. He is uh, he, he used to be the premier, I believe, uh, for a while, and um, and he's and he's highly respected for that. And I think that she understood. Because eventually, dear leader understands. Dear leader is not completely blind in uh, in death. Uh, that something is going very, very, very wrong. So he needs somebody else, and he needs to um, to endow this new person with enough um, credit and with enough of his own prestige, and to uh, to so he be able to do whatever he wants him to do. And also, he wants to show that. Uh, it's an old uh, trick in in cults of personality type, type of government in which dear leader pretends, oh no, I was deceived. I, no worries, I purge all my bad advisors and now I'm taking a new advisor. Of course, the new advisor is somebody that used to be, that is very, very loved and and, uh, and respected but in certain circles. And now he ties back those circles that used to be skeptical of him back to him. And But of course, the new advisor um, is just an underling, is just ornament, is just uh, is just something. Because eventually, even if the advisor might push some policy through, through uh, dear leader, thick thick skull, eventually dear leader does whatever dear leader wants. And and besides, that advisor is just one voice out of many. And remember, most of those voices, most of those underlings don't do things upon express or expressed the wishes of dear leader, they do them because they know dear leader and they think they can guess more or less what he wants. Fascinating, fascinating. Well, we will talk about this and many other things regarding the Chinese question, which is paramount in our minds and which will be with us, unfortunately, for a long time to come in future episodes. In the next segment, we will be talking about the Russian invasion of the Ukraine. When the war is over will set us down at ease and plow and sow and reap and mow and do just as we please the next segment are we bored with the russian invasion of the ukraine i bring this up ironically because the past week or two has been full of um, exciting and interesting and news, new news, so to speak, about the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Six months ago, the uh, what was hitherto thought to be the strongest military power in Europe, and what was referred to back then as the strongest army in, the second strongest army in the world, afterwards, <laughs> jokingly, Isaac knows his joke, afterwards it was the second strongest army in the Ukraine. <laughs> but the second strongest army in the world, the Russian military invaded Ukraine. Uh, this was a naked power grab. Uh, there are many wars in history that there is some question as to who the aggressor is because usually one person's army crosses the border, mm -hmm. but maybe the other guy was preparing for war. Maybe there was a, a preemptive strike. The concept of preemptive strikes being a moral justification is mentioned in Talmudic Jewish sources and other theological texts. Uh, Aquinas talks about it, and um, mm. the Bellum Grotius, the Bellum Justum, and, and it has existed for a very long time. Uh, but I'm 
not, I'm not here to speak about the moral ethics, but rather to say this was such a shockingly naked aggression. And it was such a surprise for the people who watched themselves to be surprised. The, the people in Europe, the European Union bureaucratic type people, the Angela Merkels of the world, and the Karl Schwab, the Schwabs of the world, and even the Boris Johnson of the world, who were busy with such important subjects as we need to put up more windmills so, there we, so therefore we can close more nuclear reactors, but in the process put our, make ourselves vulnerable because we don't have enough gas to power our energy needs in the continent of Europe. Such subjects as there are not enough you know, women on the boards of certain companies in, in Europe and so on. Such subjects as um, you know, should the Europeans accept millions of immigrants from Africa and Europe and is it illegal or immoral to reject them? And so on and so forth. All these seemingly important subjects or I would put it differently important shibboleths, especially of the left, but of the European in general, right included, myself mm -hmm. included, seem to be much less important when you consider that another country, a giant country that on paper had a military of close to two million and more than a thousand weak fixed wing aircraft and thousands of nuclear weapons, invaded their slightly smaller but still fairly large country. Mm -hmm. um, next to them, without being able to convince the world that they were actually worried, but the Russians were quaking in their beds, terrified the Ru Ukrainians would come and invade them and drive all the way to Moscow. Excuse me. Excuse me. Or, or even the lesser threat of the Ukrainians joining NATO, which would never have happened because one of the preconditions to joining NATO is wisely the country joining NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, the treaty that has protected Western Europe. Um, from the Russian aggression since the end of the World War II when it was signed at the behest of Americans with the express purpose of keeping the Germans down, the Americans in, and the Russians out as put by the former Secretary of State. We no longer want to keep the Germans out, maybe we should discuss that now or in the future, but we still want to keep the Russians out, but no country could um, join NATO if their territorial um, boundaries are not set in stone because it makes sense because let's say there was a dispute over the land, then the NATO country will say, hey, I was invaded, please join me. And then the other NATO countries will say, I don't want to join you. This land was never yours. And therefore the whole uh, notion of NATO, which was territorial sovereignty that were respecting the borders. And if you cross that border, even by itsy teensy weensy little bit, you have now crossed the border of the entire NATO. You have now the righteous fury of the entire coalition, which in theory could with millions of troops in the battlefield with tanks and aircraft and artillery uh, opposed to you, um, all of that would then be called into the question. Therefore, Ukraine was not really joining NATO, but it was um, brought up as a sort of uh, dream, a, a nightmare dream that the Ukrainians or some of the Ukrainians latched onto, and Putin used that and other excuses to pretend that he was justified in invading the country. And he tried taking the place by coup de main. You don't hear that term anymore. Coup de main is like when you come to a castle and instead of trying to besiege it the old fashioned way and knock it down with your cannons or your trebuchets, you try to storm it so fast that the people in the castle are so bewildered and so shocked and so taken aback by your aggressive and, and militaristic stance that you're in the castle before you know it, you control the castle. And which is what the Russians tried doing to Ukraine. We all remember they were within the streets of Kiev. They, the used, suburbs, the suburbs. They were in the streets of Kiev, I'll explain how. So we now know from the Time article and other, uh, other places that have uh, interviewed Zelensky, and who is the prime minister, who is the president, sorry, of Ukraine and so on, that the airport near Kiev, the all important airport, the site of furious fighting in the first day, was used to ferry helicopters, Hostomol airport. And that somehow ended up with Russian troops in the streets of Kiev. Now these were, you know, so to speak, uh, fifth, a combination of fifth columnists, mercenaries, but also their elite um, special forces to the extent that according to the Time magazine, they gave an actual rifle to the president of the Ukraine, Mr. Zelensky himself, and his staff who had to go down the elevator into the underground bunker under the palace, destroy the elevator after them, darken all the lights to prevent them from being attacked with um, uh, 
you know, guided munitions and so on and so forth. There was, according to the reports, firing in the streets of Kiev. And there was such rapid advancements from the north, from the east, and from the south using combined arms that everybody, especially myself, thought the war would be over very quickly. I would hasten to say that I read now in the Institute of War great, uh, great source of information on the Ukrainian war that the Russian forces have lost an area larger than Denmark since the high water mark of their invasion of Ukraine. So the Russians still have Crimea, they have the south of the country, and they have the east, they have much of the Donbass. But despite that they have lost such a large area the size of Denmark, ah, but you say, well, what, what sort of gains have they made? Well, in the past month and a half, according to the State Institute of War, they have gained an area the size of Andorra. For those of you who don't know, Andorra is a country with a population of 40,000 between France and Spain, and they're skiing and they have two presidents. It's a very complicated story, I think. One of which is the president of France. Yes. <laughs> uh, my, my eminent co-host, Isaac, knows the complicated story. I oh, thought oh. I was trying to pull a fast one on you. <laughs> but let me just finish by saying that the Kurd war is somewhat stalemated. American munitions, American and British munitions, which have helped stem the tide. The Germans have done very little in fear and terror of losing their exports, by losing their manufacturing, by losing their energy. The, all three of those ducks are lined up in a row because they had the unfortunate tendency of making them themselves entirely dependent on the bad Russian wolf by allowing them to buy energy from their wicked neighbor to the east. Which, if I may intercede, um, the, intercept you, uh, which was completely unnecessary. This was Angela, Mer Angela Merkel's, for years she was hailed as the greatest uh, diplomatic genius of the, of the 21st century because she closed all the German nuclear plants specifically so they can, so germany would have to buy uh gas from uh from russia of course the excuse was environmentalism but come on uh, the, uh so I hail but not by hell by us <laughs> <laughs> i don't think we ever made a mistake of hailing her yeah <laughs> and uh and the and the uh, and so the idea was if russia sell sells uh, lots and lots and lots of of gas to the germans then Russia, it's not G Germany that is dependent on Russia, because, but it's Russia that's dependent on Germany for finances. Ah, the, the logic would seem to be inescapable until, until unfortunately this winter, when until you have, are worried that German uh, civilians are going to be cold because they until you to. until you understand that the government run by a former KGB agent, a, a, by a former KGB agent don't really grasp the importance of finances, but they do grasp the importance of fuel. I think, as a leader, she must be worthy of our particular scorn and fury and criticism. But few other leaders, the Green Party, which if I recall correctly is the third, maybe the fourth largest party in Germany. It's like having a party just dedicated to the windmill gods as your political party. Like, how could you take country seriously like that? The Jill Stein party of, of Germany. But even her party, which is a right-wing party, or as Mark Stein would say, the left of right of left of right of right of center party of mm -hmm. Germany. In other words, it's so infinitesimally slightly to the left party that is the right party um, any, every party including probably the quote unquote neo-Nazis of the AFD which is the right wing party which is not a neo-Nazi party in my estimation but has been um, aligned as such even they are talking about the windmills yeah. so, everyone, so, so every single party everyone in Germany is guilty of this I don't think anyone would have done differently they're all guilty of exposing themselves to this massive vulnerability where you cannot have a modern country exist without energy, without electricity, without the fuel to keep your factories going and keep your population warm in the winter. Yeah, absolutely. And the thing is, nuclear energy was the ma w nuclear energy for all intents and purposes is magic, as especially as concerning uh, the energy woes of a country like Germany that have very precious little uh, fuel. Uh, on its own, if you dis if you discard coal. Oh, by the way, they are burning now the worst type of coal that there, that there is. That uh, basically it's a uh, it's coal that's so infused with wa with water that uh, that it's the most it's mm, the, it's, not the, the clean coal, it's, the, it's the worst thing that you can burn uh, env environment wise. Well, I mean, I think well, 
I think, Ligamite, Ligamite. I Thank think you. burning coal is a wonderful thing. Now, you could perhaps, for a slightly more expensive, burn a cleaner coal. Uh, yeah. I think we do some of that in America. Yeah, absolutely. But I think coal, you know why? Because there's still do, 2 billion people in the world who don't burn coal. You know no. what they burn? Wood. And we know what else? Go ahead. Dunk. Dunk, of they, course. They burn uh, and animal oh, yes. droppings and wood, which are burned by 2 billion people in the world for their energy needs. Yes. So, um, you know, more than a million people die a year in Africa from inhaling this terrible fumes in their you in know, the little, little huts. huts, you know. Coal is a wonderful thing. We should No, no, coal, we, we coal, should, coal should, is a wonderful step should, forward, but if but as you want remember, the more polluted polluting a fuel source is, it means that more uh, atoms are not used in actually producing energy. Pollution is waste. It's, it's literally waste. So, uh, uh, so, so you went. So you have at the bottom at the bottom of, of the line you have dung, then which is very unpleasant. Um, then you have wood, which is an improvement somehow, which we achieved somewhere around the 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 the, 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 uh, the Paleolithic age. Uh, then you have. Uh, then you have a coal, which we started burning in large amount, wh- which uh, exploiting in uh, in very large amount, essentially fueled our industrial revolution. Uh, all hail James Watt. Uh, and uh, the then you have oil. Uh, you have oil, and it's various product. It starts with uh, with the raw with, with uh, raw petroleum. Then you go. Then you go up and up and up. And then you have something that's completely out of fossil fuels, you have nuclear. In nuclear, yes, 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 we all have the problem of nuclear, of nuclear waste, which is actually not that consider, considerable, uh, but um, it's, not, it's not as dangerous as it sounds, but this is basically magic. You don't need, you need uranium, which yes, it's pretty hard to find, but if you, but there are enough countries uh, which, are of, uh, which are friendly to Germany, such as Australia, that can produce uranium that Germany uh, for a very little, uh, at a very little expense, essentially can create free energy without any kind of uh, of pollutants releasing releasing to the air, which is something that Germans really care about. And I and I do not intend to dismiss German concern, this German concern. If they are allowed to have their concerns, but then in the name of this singular luxury concern, you go all the way back to the worst type of coal. That's just idiotic. And of course, the Germans are. Well, I don't want to insult the country of Germany, but uh, let me just say that the, the that that the French are are, sh- are showing more moral fiber than the Germans on this part on this particular war. Yes, and they're not showing all that much. Um, Macron desperately trying to get uh, the Ukrainians to. Uh, pitch it on some terms in order to establish peace. Um, but that's I, I would add, by the way, that uh, as our audience ought to know, and this is why there is only a minority at times, or at least a part of energy needs are electricity. So nuclear power could only provide electricity, not other energy needs, but mm-hmm. you'll need other, other, other sources. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'll also add that um, Coal has other advantages, not least which being that you could always throw in more coal. You could bring it on and offline very quickly. Mm-hmm. Uh, if Germany decide, would decide to nuclearize today, it would take, and if they didn't get rid of the regulations, it would probably take four to ten years to build a nuclear reactor. If they did get rid of their certain regulations by some miracle, then it perhaps would take two to three years. Not as instant a solution as you would need in an actual crisis which we're in right now. Mm-hmm. So, all hail King Cole. Um, let me finally say, so this invasion of the Ukraine has exposed many issues which have always existed and perhaps festered and so on, but which has not had light shine on them. So we're not here to say there was no do- dead body in the room, but by turning on the lights, we now see it on the ground. So we hope over the course of time to speak about many of the issues and I would say plights that beset the Europeans that the war has unfortunately exposed but of course we would speak about the war itself and the context. Now we will move on to the next segment. 
Then each lad shall take his last All beaming like a star And in his loving arms forget The dangers of the war um. Hi, we are returning um, And Joseph and I, we mentioned before uh, the dangers of cult of personality. We mentioned the uh, the Germans, uh, how the Germans talk themselves into a radical uh, notion of environmentalism that ended them up uh, committing acts of extreme folly in terms of energy. And this leads to the question of democracy. What is the alternative? Well, and I'm using democracy in a very broad term because. Um, uh, what is the alternative to cult of personality type of rule? The, uh, of course, the other alternative is that you have uh, some sort of a circle of equals that can debate each other and eventually the best debater, or let's face the best, uh, the person who is best at uh, winning the favors of the majority, is the one who prevails and... Um, and he's the one whose will is carried through. Now, this can happen in a democracy. It can happen in, uh, it can happen in, uh, in a, an aristocracy or an, an oligarchy. Uh, but it cannot happen in a type of one-person rule that is, uh, that, is, that is absolute tyranny. By the way, uh, democracies are not immune from cults of personality. It's possible that in a democracy you'll have a leader who's extremely, extremely popular, who solidified his power, and because he solidified the favor that most people uh, feel towards him. And people vote for him again and again and again, not because of his ideas as much as because of their personal sentiments towards him. Um, we see it, unfortunately, in... Um, in a, even in a, here in America, from time to time, we have candidates that simply at a certain point don't need to represent to present any uh, logical arguments. They just are who they are, and therefore a large segment of the population would vote for them. Um, we see it on both sides of the aisles, unfortunately, which leads to both parties don't making much sense right now. Uh, and but it can, but very often such a democracy. Uh, but very often, those leaders, either they're ejected by the democracy, because eventually you'll have a critical mass of people who don't like you, uh, and who understand that you have no arguments, and uh, or, they ej or they eject the democracy, because there are only two, that many times that someone can be elected uh, to the highest position in the land. There are only so many decades that you can rule without any kind of competition before you decide to make it official. Um, and so, uh, what we see in the and, and so the alternative is a discussion between equals. Now, as we saw in the case of Germany, which is a democracy in which basically there is for a very, everybody agrees on the ideas of environmentalism and the ideas that we should be that you should everybody agreed. On the closure of the nuclear of the nuclear plants and other independent German independent uh, sources of energy besides importing all the most of the energy from Russia, that it's not a guarantee. Neither neither of them is a guarantee against uh, the public committing great follies and error in term of policy. But uh, but what we cannot. Uh, have is that in the alternative which I called the board based the board ba the broad based sorry which can also be imagined as a board um, as in a board of directors uh, at least you'll have a debate of some sort and the debate can be rational debate can be irrational doesn't matter. <coughs> doesn't matter in a cult of personality you don't have a debate because uh, because at least not one who is based on any sort of uh, of th any sort of fact that is independent on the will of one person, and this is why, while while let's say the European public 
to a degree committed a lot of errors and follies in since the 90s the European public can still shake shake them away um, it, Russia cannot because as long put, as putting is in power his ideas go and by the way after long enough that the country got, grew accustomed to a cult of personality the ability to debate and to have the board of directors style of leadership of uh, of e- of debates among of debate among equals atrophies and disappears people both the electorate and the leadership lose the power to reason and to make arguments based on fact and I believe that this is the reason that uh, the rush the Russian democracy failed in the 90s remember remember that Putin was not elected president when he became president he was appointed because the because Boris Yeltsin had to resign over a scandal and this is where I leave it under suspicion Yeah, absolutely. So while you were speaking, I was re- reminded of something I read in Bertrand Russell, History of Western Philosophy, which I may have, upon him. which I may have quoted once in this in this podcast series before. Oh, yeah. And I would wonder if you would indulge me in something of a longer quote. Mm-hmm. And that is as follows. He's speaking Go about ahead. Plato's uh, ideal form of government, and Plato's speaking about how you need to have your government be run you know, on, on the principles of wisdom. Mm-hmm. seems good enough mm-hmm. here Bertrand Russell makes now I you know Bertrand Russell was something of a socialist even communist although he was somewhat reformed to the extent that the CIA secretly bankrolled him to write in the post-war and as post-world to era a book against communism <laughs> from the leftist perspective well I wonder if, if much of our audience knows that but despite all that I don't necessarily uh, see eye to eye with him on many political things but I think what he says here is profound so let me mention this to you and I think this might tickle your fancy he says as follows but even if we suppose that there is such a thing as wisdom is there any form of constitution which will give the government to the wise it is clear the majorities like general consuls may err and in fact have erred aristocracies are not always wise kings are often foolish popes in spite of infallibility have committed grievous errors would anyone advocate and trust in the government to university graduates <laughs> or even doctors of divinity oh God or to men who having been born poor have made great fortunes it is clear that no legally definable selection of citizens is likely to be wiser in practice than the whole body the problem of finding a collection of white wise and quotes men and leaving the government to them is thus an insoluble one thus that is the ultimate reason for democracy thus say is the birth from Russia and this I would say one more thing and then I'll let you take it away and what your reaction is I'll come now to my quote if I could find it and uh, we will try to bring this political and even though we try to aim for a uh, timeless show once in a while you have to do something from the current day so I think this was from today or yesterday where one of the issues you have in all maturing democracies and we see this now on our own and every issue as Isaac has told me recently in modern times gets accelerated but Germany has a way of accelerating every good and bad thing so the thing that we face now is Is instead of democracy a rule by experts and who is a greater expert piece of on him than dr. Fauci and here's something that Ron DeSantis, as governor of Florida said I think yesterday or today when he heard that this uh, our esteemed dr. Fauci is thinking of retiring he said chief apothecary of the realm yes <laughs> the chief apothecary of the realm is thinking of retiring Ron DeSantis said someone needs to grab the little elf and chuck him across the Potomac <laughs> <laughs> and I thought that was I, I I hope that people enjoy our shows in a hundred years from now I'm not sure if I'll may understand point, may the point out, of that we may point out that Ron DeSantis himself is not exactly a man of imposing physical structures uh, which makes it even funnier uh, but he was a big football player at one point and a soldier for oh years. yes yes he was uh, he, he was he was uh, he was uh, an attorney for the for he was attorney for the Navy in Fallujah ah was he actually in Fallujah though oh yeah he was in Fallujah pretty dangerous place yeah as an attorney Speaking of quick line they were using white phosphorus in Fallujah oh yeah something the liberals had the yeah. knippin about it. and he oh he, not football he went to Yale on a baseball uh, oh, scholarship baseball, but, yeah different uh, I think people might 
I might betray my European sensibilities if people don't think I know anything about sports. <laughs> people will, f- will figure out we're doing this in an underground bunker in Luxembourg. No. But don't let the, the secret get out. So that's just my bit of Dr. Fauci quote and my Bertrand Russell quote on democracy. Any additional thoughts? Uh, yeah. Uh, the, the thing is, while we're, we're trying here not to be... Uh, Uh, pol- not to be extreme, not to be on one side of the aisle. We're not trying. To- we're trying not to become creatures of party, and because becoming creatures of party is only is almost as bad as becoming creatures of uh, of a particular politician, which is uh, which is the worst fate imaginable for any thinking person. Because then you are bu- you are duty bound to w- that whatever stupid stupid thing dear leader would do or say or think. Um, or be alleged to, th- to th- or be alleged to have thought or, or, or say or said or did uh, your duty bound to justify it somehow and believe me every politician would do as would do or say or think or be accused of of doing saying and, th- and thinking something stupid and evil uh, in the, during their career uh, actually three times before breakfast but uh, so uh, so that's the, the worst fate possible so if we uh, so Uh, but we must strive not to we must strive not to and the reason I have particular um, ire and scorn towards dr. fauci Peace w- be upon him. Be- okay I no problem I'm, I'm considering him like a demigod like Alexander was a god but dr. fauci is a little bit above Alexander. yes is because he killed he killed debate in this co- in this country about the efficacy of lockdowns Um, and in every subject because you cannot have a scientific debate if Dr. Fauci is science there was a cult of personality and I blame the and, and I blame the president at the time Donald Trump who also developed a cult of personality among, uh, around himself of not um, of not curbing that cult of personality in the in the crib because the cult of personality started when the, when uh, when when the president, appointed him into a special position special something 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 to the president for health care uh, whatever uh, well, that was a personality I would say by the way you know the story you know Achilles was dipped in the river Styx yes. but his mother held him on by the by the, by the yes. heel yes. hence that part was immortal so when Trump was dipped in the Styx half of his body was covered up so his immortality was, was very much vulnerable and saying, his vulnerability was his germophobia so he had many vulnerabilities unlike Achilles who just had the heel but his chief thing Was, was personnel his chief uh, his chief um, the, the thing that did him in I mean whether you hate him or love him but the thing that did him in was his personnel and, and personality not his person personnel people working for him yeah and and his so his inability to uh, to rein in the Burks and, and fauci uh, team for example mm-hmm. and we now know Burke, dr. Burks has now um, has now gone on television saying that she's proud of the fact that she managed to evade the Uh, the, the presidential um, desires and orders and so on and, and, and countermand them but but he, he one of his main Achilles heels was he was unable to control the executive branch which you would expect a strong man as he was accused of being able to do so our theory must be that must be changed that Trump is not a strong man as a matter of fact he's a very weak and cowardly man and uh, and his cowardice uh, manifests itself and I know I know I just alienated so many people but uh, manifests it in various ways first of all is germophobia he's afraid of being sick now we all afraid of being sick but we don't uh, but we don't farm out all the po- all our the health care policy of our of, of the entire country to uh, the, to a person who was known to be a little bit on the cosh a little bit extremely on the cautious side and In, in what goes to in not to get epidemiology because we are afraid to get sick also he's afraid of being of being accused to be fair he was accused of many many thi- of many many things so you know uh, you know you, you get uh, scolded cats and all that uh, but 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 that was his tendency to farm out decisions to quote unquote experts and then when the experts did not deliver the results that he liked then he could fire then he could fire them And, uh, and claimed that they were bought by some that they were bought and by his political enemies or joined them which <clears throat> and that antagonist and that antagonism that he developed 
actually turn into true antagonism because when when you blame someone that you hired and you told him that he have f- free reign to do whatever he thinks uh, necessary to to dis- to save the country and make the president look good and and then you turn on them because you don't like the decision and you fire them um, in a usually in a very very humiliating manner and uh, and proceed to to, to use the your Twitter account to insult them and call them either a traitor or a fool or whatever else guess what there, there will be con- there will be consequence most people in public office and public service have huge egos and even and, and even normal size egos will not stand for for such a tr- for such a treatment and so Trump lost one ally after another until he was left with none except uh, those who were utterly and So, except the the utterly servile ones I'm not saying that people who still like Trump are servile no I'm talking about the people who actually have to work with him side by side every day I agree completely with, completely with your assessment except that I would say I'm thinking of his high profile uh, cases uh, Rex Tillerson Mattis yeah Kelly which all resigned uh, at one point or another all of them Bolton all of them generally speaking, betrayed him before he called them horse face and and said they were guilty of treason and he threw the kitchen sink at them well they be, I mean, well the fight betrayed him so because Rex Tillerson for example right you know he completely undermined America's foreign policy mm-hmm. the Trump vision mm-hmm. and he single-handedly prevented Trump from leaving that Iran deal which he promised to do right away and which was delayed by close to a year and so on and so forth um, well, John Bolton. <laughs> <laughs> McMaster you know um, you know ironically uh, Jeff Sessions mm-hmm. you know um, for Jeff Sessions you know I know Alan Coulter loves Jen, Jeff Sessions and he was great on immigration and so on unfortunately his one decision to recruit himself from the Russian investigation because he forget he forgot under oath that he met the Russian ambassador a man who in public life who meets thousands of people and would not, not be able to meet the ambassadors in the lineup because he's attorney general not the Secretary of State and Because of that, he recruited himself from the Russian investigation, which single-handedly destroyed the Trump presidency. Well, the Russian... Pre- Actually, I believe that the Russian investigation did not destroy the, the Trump presidency mm. because the Russian investigation was stretched out for two years. At the end of, of, and at the end of that particular cycle, you had Robert Mueller... Uh, a, 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 <laughs> Mueling in... in, in uh, And stuttering like and studying and looking at and looking utterly out of his element and after producing a report by in which he said that Trump did not do anything actionable ah but, uh, but he did put enough junk in that report yeah but there the, was enough smoke screen to make it sound like Trump was but, but this did not, and was able to but be this did not by the media yes but the, it, yeah but this did not destroy Trump this is not destroy Trump of course. presidency but, you know, I mean it it, it, that, it gave cover to I mean, if you're a Democrat and you don't want to help Trump, because you don't want him to win politically. Yes. But you could say, well, I don't want to help him. I don't, I don't want to attend his inauguration, not because he's a bad person or because he's anti-immigration, because they know those are losing issues. Ah, oh, he's a Russian asset. He's a Russian spy. Yeah. The whole Russia collusion narrative gave cover for all the Democrats, including the moderate Democrats, who would have been under tremendous fire to actually assist the president who was delivering 4 or 5 percent GDP growth. Yeah. And who was... Uh, you know pulling out of Afghanistan for goodness sake something that the Democrats lo- would have loved for years and years and was actually defeating ISIS taking them from a caliphate to a little uh, to a little mosque in, in, in the bad side of town that Dover wants to enter the thing that per- was able to give political cover for all Democrats and for the traitorous Republicans that were leaking and so on was the fact that Trump was embroiled in the Russia collusion and therefore because he was perhaps a traitor to the realm I agree all, all bets are off I agree with you but the fact of the matter is that in 2019 after uh, after after the uh, after everything and after he was impeached not even for the thing that he was investigated for two years about but because he asked the president of Ukraine for some material For some material from some dirt of, of what his opponent which may or may not be have been legal I am not uh, uh, and uh, the, uh, the the thing is he was before before uh, before covid started he was very pop he was actually popular he was projected projected to win re-election and he was 
uh, yes, he was very hated, but he was not hated because of his of the Russia because people believe the Russia uh, collusion story, but because of other reasons because because people people did not like him very much because he's not the, the Russia collusion story was much more I uh, I think you would agree with me is was much more significant for the educated left as opposed to the independents mm -hmm. who who I think you would say you know abandoned the narrative let's say when it was destroyed or when it wasn't proven and so on so yeah i i you know maybe he had uh, he still had a majority or a sliver of 55 to 60 percent of the country yeah. not being not being affected by that but if you control enough of the narrative and so on and if you control enough of the educated classes that's true then but that that does a lot of that, the, that the, 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 this is true but uh back to, back to the, the, the russian collusion uh, story had an effect, but this is the this was not the thing that destroyed the the, the, the destroyed the Trump presidency. Mm. And the thing is that uh, we we talk about personnel, but personnel start with personality. The thing is, it's the job of the president. The president when the president hires someone to become uh, a cabinet member, especially someone in such an elevated position as Secretary of State, the position that used to be considered. Uh, the 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 unofficial second command to the, to the United to to the to the president of the United States, it's your duty to hire the the, the right people who agree with you, or to hire people that you ought to be able to bring them to agree to your side. If you don't, that means guess what? You are bad at this. You're yes. bad. You. I think we can say without fear of contradiction that he was an abject failure in hiring, and and he and, and in persuading. And thus he himself is victim to his own misdeeds and, this is the and his own personality. And this point. is the thing. Trump yeah. is a creature that can, is a leader that can thrive only in a cult of personality situation. He's not very good at board meetings. That's, by the way, the reason that if you look at all the corporation that he headed, he usually was the only member of the board, or at least all the other members or family members, people depend on him, etc., etc., etc. So when you get... Uh, a star like like James like James Mattis, the warrior monk, the J Mad Dog Mattis, the, uh, the, 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 the 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 a man that was considered a patron saint of everything military and uh, and uh, and everything else, and uh, who who by the way was a, is a lifelong is a lifelong moderate Democrat, and you bring him in, do you really expect him to to just to to just go? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. For everything you say, no. It's your job to sit down with, with sit down with with good with good old with the good old general, and if you want him to do something, persuade him, give in to him, meet him halfway. That's the only reason you should hire someone like this. If you hire H. R. McMaster, the man who wrote the the seminal work on why we why America fell in Vietnam, the reliction of duty, highly recommended. Uh, do you really expect him to just listen? To you, uh, somebody who 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 draft dodged uh, the, 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 that's that very same war on bone spurs. Thank you very much. Oh, by the way, Biden uh, uh, draft it, it dodged the draft on 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 teenage, uh, not because he had asthma at the time of the draft, but because when he was a teenager he had asthma, which may or may not be true. Uh, but before, after his stuttering. Yes, exactly. <laughs> but but besides this point, I'm. And I'm not, I'm not a man for the I, I personally I'm not for the draft, but that's another topic of discussion. But the thing is, do you expect him to listen to you just because you said something? No, you need if you want him to if you want him to do what you want, you need to be persuasive. You need to sit to sit with him and said, General McMaster, good mor good morning, have a coffee. I have I have the, such and such ideas. I understand that you that, that your position is different. Let's talk. I have great. Uh, I have, I have great uh, respect to your position on all military matters. Please explain to me why your position is like that, and let me explain to you what information I have and what opinions I have, and maybe we can work something out. Because those people are not born to be servile yes men, and well, let's, let's and be... you don't want servile yes men in those positions because the American government is not built for because the American government is built as as. Abraham Lincoln put it: "A team of rivals. It, it's built to be decided by debates because debate among people with big egos and big experience and big and, and great treasure troves of prestige lead to fact-based debates. Okay. Because that's the only way you can you can win. Sorry, we don't know what happened behind closed doors, but we could definitely say 
that he hired them. It's, it's his responsibility they don't work out, if they don't, if they don't uh, do what's best for the country. And we must leave it at that. The continuing autopsy of the Trump presidency is something that I have in high fascination. I'm glad we talked about that. I would, in conclusion, before we finish off our last segment of our first episode of a political nature, uh, remind our audience that in these political episodes, anything goes. And as you saw, we will speak about all manner of political issues um, that face us in today, today's day and age. We spoke about war and peace, high and low personalities. We spoke about coal and windmills, yuck, and all manner in between. Would you, would you say that's a fair assessment of our new, of our new show? That's a fair assessment. And, of course, we will have uh, we'll have historical episodes in which we examine our ideas about li- the age-old ideas about liberty and tyranny uh, through historical prism and through literary and poetic and artistic prism. But, of course, now we'll also have political episodes. Yeah, and I don't even think we will whet our audience's appetite by even telling them that in the future we might be doing some interviews. So we won't even mention that. Oh, no, absolutely we not. We won't even tell them absolutely, that. So that, that absolutely not. Story. And we would not by, we will not tell you anything about a certain gentleman from Kentucky. Uh, but the, We may interview in the future. But stick around for our coming episodes our history episodes and our political episodes. This is Joseph and Isaac on the Iron and Rock Podcast. Have a good evening. Very well, you sweetheart, you smiling girls are you. And when the war is over, we'll kiss it out.